Hey guys, welcome to the Biomechanics 1 video series, looking at the fourth and final part of this uh, particular series, the link between linear and angular motion. So we've been alluding to this um, throughout this uh, series of videos, and today we'll kind of find a kind of put the, the final links together. So if I started at position 1 and ultimately started rotating all the way around to position 2, I'm sure that you guys will agree with me that any point on this line doesn't matter where it's located, will have moved the same angular displacement to this point in time, uh, or to this particular position. Um, so if this was point 0.4 and this is point 0.1, uh, and therefore it moved to this position sometime later, they would have all moved through the same angle in the same time, and therefore all have the same angular uh, velocity. So remember that angular velocity is equal to this change in angular position and the time in which it took to change that angular position. right? So it started here in terms of 0.4 on the straight line and it ended up here in terms of 0.4 on this line. It would have moved through that same angle in the same period of time as 0.1 took. right? So that should be relatively uh, intuitive. But a major difference is this change in arc length, right? So if you think about um, point 0.4 on this uh, radial component, it would have moved through some arc length that looked something like that, whereas point um, 0.1 moved through an arc length that looked something like that drastically different. So there must be some component of this that is moving much, much faster in terms of 0.4 versus a much, much slower velocity for or speed for 0.1. And you'll find that the, the uh, linear velocity of this particular object or point on a rotating object is going to be much higher for a point further from the axis of rotation than a point closer to the axis of rotation. So if you think about a point right on the circumference, will have some kind of linear velocity as it tends to rotate uh, around, right? Uh, which will be much faster than a point closer to the axis of rotation. So in that same time period, this will be much, much less as it tends to rotate around. So that the axis um, tends to be moving hardly at all, right? Whereas a point on the edge would be moving much, much faster. So if you ever looked at a rotating object, and hopefully I'll find a video or two that can kind of prove that to you guys, you'll see that points around the edge seem to be moving at a much, much higher velocity or higher speed relative to a point closer to the axis of rotation. If you remember that we have a specific formula that we looked at probably in video one that can tell me exactly what this angular... Uh, so this uh, arc length is relative to the angle through which something moves. And it looks something like this. It said that the, the arc length through which something moves is equal to the angular displacement in radians multiplied by the radius, the length of the radius. So you'll find that point 0.4 is uh, much further from the axis of rotation right, than point 0.1. So point 0.1 is a lot closer, right? So point 0.1 is kind of only this distance from the axis of rotation, point 0.2 or point 0.4 is significantly further away, right? So technically speaking, its radius for point 0.4 is much greater than the radius of point 0.1 on this uh, complete uh, radius of the circle. So let's kind of see how that applies. So if I wanted to see the rate at which this distance changes relative to the time it takes to cover that distance, I could just kind of take the time rate of change of this uh, arc length, right? So if I divide both sides by time to measure how quickly it was covering that distance, I would sit with a formula that looks kind of like this, right? Um, which gives me some really, really important insights into what is happening. And I'll cover, uh, well, 
unpack these uh, separately. So this left-hand side, I believe we've seen this formula somewhere before. Velocity is equal to the distance covered divided by time it took to cover that distance. Well, since this arc length is a distance component, you'll find out that that is the definition for velocity. On the right-hand side of this equation, I can also unpack some really important insights, whereby I could rewrite this as being some change in angular displacement over time multiplied by the length of the radius. Well, doesn't this component look very familiar in terms of what angular velocity is? Remember, angular velocity is change in angular displacement over time. So I could rewrite all of this as angular velocity times the radius, right? So I'm sitting with a completely new formula, um, which we've just unpacked, that says that the linear velocity is equal to the angular velocity times the length of the radius, right? So if I had to look at point 1, the linear velocity for point 1 is equal to the angular velocity, which is the same as for point 2. Let's say, for example, that this uh, rotation, this angular rotation, was occurring at 2 radians per second, and it took uh, 3 seconds to cover this angular displacement. So the time is 3 seconds. We'll say that uh, length 1, so length 1 is equal to 0 0.2 meters, and we'll say length 4 is equal to 0 0.5 meters. So the radius for 1 uh, can be given as 2 radians per second multiplied by the length of radius 1 which is 0 0.2, which gives me a linear velocity of 0.1 as being zero, uh, 0 0.4, and this is going to be in meters per second. The linear velocity for 0.2, which is located a little bit further from the axis of rotation, is the same angular velocity times the radius of 0.4. So that's going to be, uh, let me just undo that, uh, it's going to be that same, 2 radians per second times this 0 0.5 length of the radius, um, which is equal to 1.0 meters per second. So you can kind of see that they both have their own unique linear velocities. And you can see that 0.4 is going to be moving significantly faster than 0.1. And the primary reason for that is how far it is located from the axis of rotation. Okay, so you have this linear component being linked to the angular component. Okay, so let me just rewrite that for a sec. If I have this being true, then I might be interested in terms of how quickly the velocity is changing. Let's say, for example, that uh, something was acting on this wheel and was making it spin faster and faster and faster and faster around. Or something might be acting on this wheel and slowing it down. So there's a change in this rotational velocity that tends to happen. right? So again, I would want to measure what this angular velocity is at any respective point in time and what its effect will be on this linear velocity component. So again, I could take the time rate of change of that. So I simply divide it by time on both sides. And I'll again sit with a new formula. I can unpack each side as I did previously. So velocity over time should start ringing a few bells. Uh, let me just make this a little bit lower. So velocity over time can be unpacked as the linear acceleration 
Remember that was defined as velocity over time. And on the right hand side of the equation, I also have something quite interesting going on where I can unpack this and rewrite it as w over t times r. And remember that uh, this kind of looks familiar in terms of angular acceleration. Remember, angular acceleration was defined as the change in angular velocity over time. So I could rewrite this entire formula as being the linear acceleration being equal to the angular acceleration times the radius. Okay. Remember that angu uh, linear acceleration as well as angular acceleration can be some value that is positive, negative, or zero. If angular or linear acceleration is equal to zero, does that mean that angular um, or linear velocity is equal to zero? And the answer to that should be no. Acceleration is not dependent on velocity. Velocity is not dependent on acceleration. It's not indicative of acceleration. Remember, acceleration is always to equal to the change in velocity over the change in time. And similarly, the angular acceleration is the change in angular velocity over the change in time. Therefore, acceleration is not equal to velocity. It's equal to the change in velocity. Same with angular acceleration. is not equal to the angular velocity. It is equal to the change in angular velocity. Right? That would be correct. Right? So same thing that if I have this rotating disk, right, it might be rotating with some angular velocity, but something might be causing it to slow down, right? So if angular velocity is decreasing, that is when angular acceleration will be some negative value. Okay, it's not equal to zero. It's not some positive value. It's because the final value is smaller than the initial value. right? So if I have some final value minus some initial value, where the final value is smaller than the initial value, I'm going to be sitting with some value less than zero, some negative value. So that my acceleration will be negative because this change in W will be negative. Okay. So I'm hoping that that makes sense. There will be lots and lots of uses for this in real-world applications. Let me show you one such application for a second. Over here, we have a mechanical analysis of sprinting. So you have a sprinter set up in the starting blocks. and We're going to look at their hip range of motion and their knee range of motion as they tend to transition um, from a starting to a sprinting position. And what you'll realize is that as the person initiates movement, um, you realize that they are changing the hip and knee angles of each leg respectively. So if we're looking at the red side being the side of the back leg, that in this particular position, that there's a certain amount of hip flexion and there's a certain amount of knee flexion. And that changed throughout this particular movement. So since there's a change relative to an angle, relative to time, we'll be able to calculate things like the angular velocity and the angular acceleration at which the hip joint as well as the knee joint tended to move as this athlete was beginning his start, his, his sprint start. So there are specific aspects that we would want to see and specific aspects that we would not want to see in terms of efficient sprinting mechanics. So by analyzing the, these graphs and these ranges of motion at, spe at specific points in time, we can glean some very, very interesting and very, very useful information which we'll unpack at a later stage. But again, everything that you guys are learning now does have real-world applications. So all these angular and linear velocities really do have specific applications. Um, for example, if I apply it to cricket or soccer, um, if I have, let's say, some thigh and a foot making contact with a ball, right, that this thigh, the shin, and this foot will have some kind of angular velocity uh, 
it will make contact with the ball and the ball will leave with some linear velocity. Right? So again, there's this link between angular and linear components that we'll be able to calculate. Um, if I was a cricketer and I was um, running and about to deliver a, a ball, so as that tends to rotate with some angular velocity, the ball is ultimately going to leave with some linear velocity or some linear acceleration, right? So again, I can use this combination of angular and linear velocities in order to make some useful calculations. Also true is the fact that the bowler will have a run-up, right? So the run-up will be made of a linear component, and then you've got this delivery, which is made up of the angular component, and that will have an effect on the final velocity of this ball as it leaves the hand. Okay, so lots of useful applications, applications that we use in the real world. Um, but again, this is just an introduction to the basics of how it works. Uh, these are all pretty much average values, and we, are, at the end of the day, we'll be interested in more instantaneous values. So how we get from average to instantaneous is a whole other set of lectures, and we'll cover that at a later stage. So hopefully this made some sense for now. And again, there'll be practice problems for you guys to try and solve in the Urban Kanks manual as well as your textbook. So again, let me know if you guys come right. Um, all the best in the meantime.